today to uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Ash, and I'm the Senior Library Manager for Sam Wilborough Council. And I'm also part of the Executive Committee of Chief Archivists in Local Government. In autumn this year, Libraries Connected and Chief Archivists in Local Government hosted a webinar uh, which explored how we can work in partnership in relation to the universal offers. These cover uh, reading, health and wellbeing, culture and creativity, and information and digital. One of the themes that emerged from me from that webinar was the wide variety of ways which we can work across the sector to bring added value to our customers, improve our advocacy and address broader societal goals. And I think this forms part of a bigger national conversation that building an even stronger cultural sector by working across the professions. This webinar was very much born out of the ideas and energies that came up during our first one on universal offers, as there was a really big interest in engaging digitally around heritage and local history. There's lots of exciting, innovative work going on across the country, and our speakers today will each bring a unique window into the world of tech. We're going to be recording today's webinar, so if you don't want to be on camera, feel free to turn your cameras off and please keep your mics muted during the presentations. Please feel free to note any areas you'd like us to explore in the future by popping them into the chat. And at the end, we're going to be holding a panel discussion. Um, so if you put, your, put some things in the chat, put a few in front of the question, and that will make it easier for us to spot. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sarah Chubb, who's going to introduce the speakers for today. Thanks, Chris, um, and welcome everybody. So uh, yeah, I'm Sarah Chubb, I'm uh, from Derbyshire Record Office, and I'm the Secretary of the Chief Archivist and Local Government Group. Um, and so I'll be introducing everybody today and making sure people keep to time. Um, so our first speaker is Tracy Williams, um, who is Library Specialist, um, Heritage and Local Studies at Solihull Borough Council. And Tracy's going to be talking about the Solihull Virtual High, tree, high Street. Sorry, so over to you, Tracy. Thank you, Sarah. Hopefully, the screen sharing has worked. Yep. And phew, that's a relief. Um, so, I'm the Council's archivist and local studies librarian based at the Core Library in Solihull. And I'm going to talk about what we've been doing with virtual reality with a bit of context, as we didn't just leap straight into VR, it has been an evolution. And within a framework of trying to help people to develop a sense of place through engaging experiences based on our archives and local studies resources. I'll talk through what we did, how and why, and give you some links so that you can check out what we've created. Now, I'm not from Solihull myself, but I have worked here for 21 years and I couldn't be more attached to the place if my ancestors had been here for generations. And I know that this connection is largely because of my job and the history that I've picked up. For example, I can't walk past the cancer research shop in the high street without thinking of the Mrs. Blizzard, the twin sisters who ran a greengrocer's shop on the site for about 40 years. And this sort of blended then and now image is basically the inside of my head. And I really want other people to see the place like this and to feel that same sense of place and connection that I do. I started off just putting images from our collections with audio recordings made by a local history group to create very short YouTube video clips. It seemed that the then and now approach worked quite well in anchoring people to the present whilst giving that context from the past, which helps to engender a sense of place. I created some then and now exhibitions in our heritage gallery, which had been very well received. And then in 2019, I went very out of my comfort zone and attended a meeting of Solihull Tourism Forum to beg for money for sponsorship to pay for a publication of a town trail leaflet. This was successful with the MD of the local shopping centre and Solihull bid stumping up the money. 
they launched the leaflet with our cabinet members and I did a series of guided walks to promote it. During lockdown, I also converted the trail into a YouTube video and created a Google Maps version. And the link on the slide there will take you through to a blog post explaining what we did. For several years, every time I had a conversation with people that involved anything to do with the public realm, tourism, planning, conservation, IT, I mentioned my aspiration for something, maybe an app that would help to bring the history out of the archives and into the location where it makes most sense. Everyone was interested in general terms, but nobody bit until one day in June 2019, Someone using the library study facilities overheard me talking to a customer about old photos and came up to me to ask if we had any old photos of the high street. I asked if there was anything in particular he wanted and he said, let me show you and took me over to his laptop. And it turned out that he was a retired 3D designer and for his own amusement was using the library study space and free Wi-Fi to teach himself how to use some free 3D graphics software by creating an idealized virtual high street. This included a 3D digital scale model of one of the shops in Solihull High Street. I was absolutely bowled over and said, you're not leaving until we've spoken about this. And he didn't protest too much at being kidnapped. And two hours later, we'd come up a project with a project that we were both really excited by. And luckily, my boss gave me permission just to go ahead with it and see what happened, as long as it didn't cost us any money, of course. I showed the designer a series of photos of Solihull High Street, which Solihull Council had commissioned in 1948. And the photographer had literally just gone up one side of the street and down the other, and then mounted the photos on card to form a panorama. The 1948 version of Google Street View, if you like. So I scanned the images and sent the copies to the 3D designer. He was meticulous about producing everything to scale. So I also scanned the OS 1 to 1250 maps from 1955, uh, the nearest that we had uh, to the 1948 date of the photos. I know that you'll all have the same experience as I've had throughout the whole of my career which is the area that someone wants is always on two OS maps, if not four, and this was no different. So the designer bent the digitized maps to stick them together and then added the rough 3D models. And this shows the models on the relevant place on the map. And I was just stunned when I saw this. It was created without any cost to the library service and using free 3D graphics software called Blender. By this time, it was the autumn of 2019 and the designer and I were so excited by the possibilities that with an eye on the 75th anniversary of VE Day in May 2020, we decided to try to create a YouTube video of Solihull Virtual High Street 1948 and add a narrative relating to the Second World War. In the end, the pandemic rather disrupted our plans, so things were a bit delayed, but the YouTube clip was finished on time and we still managed to hold the world premiere event we wanted to in September 2021. So I came up with Solihull Back to the Future as the umbrella term for taking content from our collections and using it with new technology to create a different type of experience. For Solihull Virtual High Street 1948, we held a post-COVID event in the core theatre, which is part of our building. There was a capacity crowd of 150 socially distanced attendees. And to make it a live event, I did a, a live commentary on some World War II silent film footage that we had. And then the designer explained what he'd done before we showed the short clip on the theatre's large screen. The audience included local historians, IT students and tutors from the local college, as well as the mayor, our cabinet member and key people in the local area, including the director of the business improvement district. The delay in our Back to the Future event because of COVID gave the designer a chance to experiment with augmented reality. 
He took one of the buildings on the high street, a 15th century property known as the Manor House that he had modeled for Solihull Virtual High Street. And he used Adobe Aero software to create an augmented reality version. You just use a smartphone or tablet to photograph the QR code. And this then prompts a download of the free Adobe Aero software if you don't have it installed. And you then click just to place the building on a flat surface. It is mind boggling. An onlooker would only see an empty table with you holding up your phone and circling around. However, through the screen on your phone or tablet, you can see the building and you can view around it. If the inside had been modelled, you could also have a look at the interior. Uh, the link on the slide there takes you through to our Solihull Life blog, which explains in more detail how it works and give you the, gives you the QR code if you want to have a go yourself or a video demo if you want to see how it works without downloading anything. The aim ultimately was to convert this to virtual reality, but we knew that this would need funding. So I kept the ideas in my back pocket to await a suitable opportunity. Remember I mentioned earlier that I attended the Solihull Tourism Forum to beg for money? Well, one of the other pre presentations was from local college students working on the Digital Innovators Skills Programme. And although this predated the virtual high street experiment, I did make contact as a result and we spoke about potential projects. Our collaboration was rather affected by COVID, but the pandemic did make us look more at our online offerings. And we thought it would be interesting to try to create a virtual reality version of the Heritage Gallery you saw on an earlier slide. The students from Digital Innovators worked on creating a VR version of the Heritage Gallery exhibition planned for summer 2022, uh, the launch of a self-published book by members of a family who'd lived in Solihull's oldest private dwelling, which was illegally demolished in the 1960s. The students created a VR version of the gallery and exhibition content rather than a VR version of the property. And it was a great experience seeing people having a go with the headsets and being able to move around a VR gallery. There were some issues with the headsets being wired and the health and safety considerations did inform how we approached our subsequent VR experience. The students' work did reinforce our ambition to repurpose the 3D virtual high street animation into a full VR project, but we were awaiting suitable funding opportunities. Then in spring 2022, along came an opportunity in the form of the National Archives and the Archives Testbed Fund. Applications were invited for innovative projects relating to the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, marking the 70th year of the late Queen Elizabeth's reign. And realising that 1953 was fairly close to 1948 and the high street wouldn't have changed much in that time, we successfully applied for funding to turn Solihull Virtual High Street 1948 um, into a Virtual High Street 1953 with an event referencing aspects of the coronation celebrations in 1953. A soundtrack was added and a crowd was created by an artist using clothes patterns from 1953 as a guide. The funding also enabled us to purchase some VR headsets and to offer a free afternoon tea to an invited audience, which comprised local historians as well as carers and those cared for, as the event also coincided with National Carers Week. For almost all the participants, it was the first time that they had experienced VR and they said they were amazed. I know those panorama photos really well, but seeing the images was nowhere close to experiencing the high street in virtual reality. It really has the wow factor. I hadn't expected VR to be so emo immersive and emotional, but it really can be. And the link on the slide there will take you to our blog post where there are links to the 1948 virtual high street animation and the 1953 version. Although what you see isn't quite the same experience as the VR, it will give you an idea of what we did, what we did. You can see from a few of the comments the, that the impact on the participants who attended our Jubilee event was more than just amazement at the technology. 
We use the VR content for other events as well. For example, we had a drop-in event during Libraries Week and attracted a diverse range of customers to try it out. Older people were interested in the local history angle. Younger people were intrigued by seeing the VR headsets in use and stopped to engage. And I'm currently arranging to take it out to a local history group when I go out and talk to them about creating local history eBooks for library members to borrow. So it does have an ongoing life beyond just this initial project. I said it was an evolution and I do have further developments in mind. Aspirations for the future include modelling shop interiors from the past, although we don't really have interior photos, so this will be a bit more creative. I'd also like to do more with augmented reality. But the thing that really inspires me is when we use our archive and local studies resources, not only to help people create something new, but also to help them learn new skills, especially those that can impl improve employability. So if in the future you see a history based Solihull VR game created by an adult version of Code Club, you'll know where that came from. In the meantime, if you have any queries outside this session, feel free to get in touch. Um, if you're likely to be in the Solihull area and want to see the VR in action, do let me know and I can arrange a session so that you can try out the headset for yourself. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tracy. That was fascinating and um, shows what you can do on a very limited budget as well. So yeah, really amazing. I'm sure lots of people will um, have um, questions, but we'll 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 move on to the next speaker and we'll we'll deal with all the questions at the end. So I'm going to hand over now to Caroline Catchpole, who is Digital Development Officer at the National Archives, and she's going to talk about the National Archives Digital Engagement Toolkit. So over to you, Caroline. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, let me just share my screen with everyone. Okay, great. So hopefully you're seeing my presentation now. Um, if I disappear, I'm going to turn my is a bit tetchy today, shall we say? <laughs> um, I'm in the office, but for some reason it's it's struggling a bit. Okay, so um, sorry, it's not Robert. Have you got Caroline's presentation there? Bear with me a second, uh, Caroline. Did you send it through to me? Okay. Um, sorry, my back. I think I just crashed there. Okay. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, let me just share my screen again and I'm keeping my uh, I'm keeping my camera off uh, so fingers crossed that you can see my presentation again okay so um let me crack on Caroline we can't see the the presentation did you send it to Robert Yes, I did, yeah. Because we might be able to just... Uh... Bear with me a second. I'm just pulling it up, Caroline. If you could stop screen sharing, I'll try and screen share from my end. Sorry about this, everyone. Bit of a tech problem. <laughs> Caroline, can you stop screen sharing? I think we, I think we may have lost we lost her. Yeah. So we um so, uh, will would you be willing to to go next and then we could come back to Caroline at the end? Yeah, that's fine. We just Thank need you. to stop her screen yeah. from sharing. So Robert, are you able to, to tell you what? I think I'll, if I'll you I'll just if, if you just start sharing, I think it will stop the other one. Will, right. so. Okay. Let me start then. I'm hoping you can see my yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, my name's Will Saunders. I'm a Chief Creative Officer for a UK research and development hub called Story Futures. 
uh, last year in partnership with the reading agency and a variety of different organizations we delivered the uk's largest immersive storytelling project to date called story trails i'm going to share with you uh some of the impact and lessons learned from that project and uh some of our aspirations for what we are hoping to do with the project next um who we are story futures is made up of a, a partnership between uh the world's number one film school the national film and television school and one of the uk's leading research universities royal holloway university um we work generally with a lot of uh creative industries partners uh specialists in screen sector and kind of um next generation storytelling um <clears throat> our engagement with with libraries has been a relatively recent uh thing um and the reason we exist um is because as i think you know the internet is, is evolving um and people refer to web 3.0 and the metaverse and um it sometimes helps to kind of give you a little bit of of, of context and apologies if you already know this stuff but uh, effectively I, I think we would acknowledge that google now own the digitization of information facebook or meta have owned the digitization of relationships in social media and what will come next is the digitization of people places and objects and that will become uh, what is referred to now as the metaverse that throws up lots of interesting opportunities if this area is new to you one of the things i'd recommend and it's a freely available uh, magazine article online uh, called welcome to mirror world by one of the former editors of wide magazine a gentleman called kevin kelly uh, and Kevin cites a number of people and companies um, and one of the early players in this space, one of the companies that was trying to dominate, was a company called Magic Leap and they pitched a variety of scenarios where they felt they could illustrate what the metaverse and what a mirror world might look like. This is one of their pitches. Simply the idea that you would see and be able to experience 3D objects in, in, in the real world. Um, and when you think about what do we mean by metaverse, there's a lot of techno babble out there. Uh, this is a relatively new area uh, full of charlatans and frauds and people pulling the wool over many people's eyes. But but if you want to understand what we mean by metaverse, I think the phrase came about from a science fiction uh, novel in 1992. All we really mean by it is, as I say, it's the digitization of people, places and objects. Uh, and it's a sort of uh, persistent internet that will exist wherever wherever you find yourself if you uh, obviously do the logical thing and just google metaverse you end up with all these sorts of uh, outlandish images that i'm sure uh, you know fill you with dread and go what the heck is that uh, this is one of the images you will find this is another so there's a there's a propensity for quite dystopian and science fiction uh visions of what a metaverse might be but the reality is there are going to be many metaverses some of them you will know you won't need any form of digital interface uh you may have heard of abba's latest show um showing in the east end of london which is an example of a metaverse there is no digital interface but everything created on that stage is done using game engines and is the representation of 3d objects in the real world i think they're referred to as avatars um we exist because this metaverse and the idea of a 3D internet will be as disruptive as Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. This is going to be a hugely lucrative space. It will be one that drives massive commercial and social value. And we need to ensure that the UK remains at the very forefront uh, in terms of generating creative industries IP in this space. Um, it's also important, I think, we try to hang on to the idea of what should what, what could the metaverse be for everybody? What happens when the metaverse is something that is ideally freely available to everybody? That was what StoryTrail set out to achieve. And I'm going to share a very quick video so you can see just a, a glimpse of what um, StoryTrails looked like on the UK tour last year.
uh, Story Trails was a partnership between uh, a variety of leading edge uh, digital studios and some traditional media organisations like the BFI and the BBC, working with the reading agency to create uh, access to uh, experiences in a network of public libraries across the UK. Our exec producer was David Olashoga, and we worked with David. I used to work at the BBC, and um, David's McTaggart lecture in 2020 accused the UK's creative industries in, in, for being in no way diverse, inclusive enough. And we um, committed to hire 50 new emerging creatives who would make all of the Story Trails projects. We worked with them to deliver essentially uh, history trails, uh, a, a variety of different experiences that took the idea of a 3D internet and placed it at the heart of these libraries up and down the UK. Um, essentially, we delivered four different types of immersive experience. I won't go into a huge amount of detail about this because there's quite a lot already on the internet, um, but this had never been done at this scale previously in the UK. Uh, it took an awful amount of, <laughs> of training uh, during COVID to, to make this happen. Um, and if you do want to know more about the project itself, I'm going to put up this QR code again at the end of this presentation, and I'll make sure that the Libraries Connected team have access. But this, this QR code takes you through to a Canva, which has a lot of embedded video images and detail about the project. But we've spent quite a lot of time talking about the project. What I really want to try to do today is tell you about the impact of the project. Because it was um, it came out of a, a university, we were able to embed an awful amount of research into the project. We had ethnographers and researchers working on the project full time. We had a greater research resource than the funder uh, was putting onto the project because everything we do, we measure. Because if we don't measure it, we can't tell people the value or the impact of it. Um, what we wanted to do with the project was bring this sort of immersive and um, metaverse ready experiences to people who hadn't previously experienced them. And 38% of participants were new to these forms of technologies. Many of us have been working in this space for quite a long time. Um, I've been working in VR for five, seven years now. And um, it was amazing when you rocked up to the libraries and saw how much people enjoyed and just reiterating what our first presenter said the impact that vr has when people do see it for the first time it is genuinely magical um we created the augmented reality trails in order to try and get people to experience uh, history in the place where they live to stamp archive physically onto geography and to reveal it to you through um, a, a mobile device this worked um 85% of people rated the uh, AR experiences and 90% said they would like to do more of this sort of activity. Um, we created immersive maps that we created by generating 3D scans of uh, all of the 15 towns and cities we visited. Uh, we generated in excess of 7,000 three-dimensional scans uh, working with tech platforms uh, that had never seen their platform used at this size and scale before. These were ways of simply capturing ordinary people's stories about the place that they lived and why they lived it, why they loved it and what was important to them about it. We had a woman in Sheffield tell us the most important place to her was the uh, the nightclub toilet that she uh, that she goes to the nightclub for, um, saying it's the best place to discover stories. We had people talk about uh, amazing love of pubs in their town or uh, going to uh, cemetery walks. The way that those stories were captured was in three dimensional scanning uh, tools and then audio testimony. And we created these amazing 3D maps that are now available uh, as 2D animations on the BFI's website and elsewhere. But this was a very powerful way of people to connect to their hometown and see themselves in, in new ways. The virtual reality, I think the entire team was genuinely surprised by the impact of, of our virtual reality experiences. We commissioned six stories working with leading VR studios in the UK 
and they they were charged to innovate around use of uh, film and TV archive with access to, and they had to tell stories that chimed with our themes around sustainability and diversity and inclusion. But everybody seems to enjoy these experiences, especially young people and children. Um, and I, I think the kind of big strategic aim of our project was to connect people to their hometown and to engender a sense of pride. And, and that seems to have happened. We were able to identify an increase in uh, civic pride and in a sense of belonging. So the idea of a project that is both national and hyper-local, uh, the idea was very much that we are creating a format that we could roll out to any town or city across the UK, but everywhere that we went, it was unique to that place. It was only really about that specific town or city. Um, and we were very lucky, I think, to develop the relationships that we did with uh, the reading agency who brokered the relationship into uh, public libraries for us and with the amazing library teams we were able to encounter. I think it was fair to say that at the moment we announced the project, there was a degree of reticence and uncertainty. We worked with a number of library teams who off the back of COVID and reduced budget were very uncertain as to what they could deliver, but every single one of them went above and beyond to make this project work. And we came out of it with a series of now I would say very strong relationships and, and our aim was really to try and create a large budget uh, arts and culture project and meet audiences who might not normally get to go to those sorts of experiences um, and in terms of what we're doing now um, I would just kind of recap uh, in summary, what we were measured against was, um, you know, I think the, the Unboxed project wanted to know about reach. 1.5 million people reached this project across the different platforms that we were able to put it onto. 89% um, of audiences gave us essentially five, four, four stars or higher out of five. We generated so many assets. Um, and, and the key thing was to identify a way in which you could create something that was national and, as I say, hyper-local. But since the project concluded um, and, and we were asked, we didn't have reporting KPIs after September last year, we actually have a prolonged legacy period, which has run from October to March. And that's where I think we've really doubled down on the relationship with the libraries. Um, and from that, we're now putting together a report that we'll be sharing with Arts Council DCMS. And um, we're very, Keen to keep this relationship going and we, un we we know that in order to do that we're going to need to find uh, new sources of funding but we think that the notion of a freely available metaverse a an infrastructure of places across the UK where the public can have access to immersive experiences is something that um, should be thought of seriously by all of the powers that be and the potential funders that can make this happen. If you think about how libraries were instrumental in uh, Web 1.0 and 2.0, Web 3.0 is almost here and it will be transformative and we need to make it publicly available. So our legacy program has helped us with regard to, um, I think, making that case in terms of building the infrastructure in libraries. But going forward, I think we would like to express a manifesto for Story Trails 2.0 that's made up of access to um, these sorts of experiences. And we think that libraries could be an amazing access point to the public. In terms of skills, we'd like to provide training for librarians to become trusted guides to the metaverse. And on relevance, we think that building on existing libraries' existing role, it's really important that we create and showcase hyper-local stories within this kind of metaverse experience. As I said, there's much more you can read about and we can share links at the end of this. But if you take the QR code, you'll find out a lot more about the Story Trails project itself. So um, that's me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Well, that really eye-opening glimpse into the future. So um, I think that's really thought provoking for all of us now. Um, I gather that Caroline should be 
back now and up and running. So I think I'll try handing over to her to finish off with the last talk. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, my I, I came into the office specifically today for this webinar, um, but there we go. Um, so hopefully Robert can share my slides, um, seeing as that's where the problem seems to be when uh, Zoom wants to quit on me when I share my slides. Brilliant. Thanks, Robert. Um, so yeah, I'm Caroline uh, Catchpole. I'm uh, the Digital Development Officer at the National Archives, and I work in the Archive Sector Development um, Department. Um, and if you could just move on to the first slide, please. So um, I'm here today to talk to you about the Digital Engagement Toolkit, um, and that was a program that was part of um, our wider digital capacity building strategy plugged in powered up for the UK archive sector and um, that has just wrapped up um, in March this year. So the strategy sought to address um, digital skills, resilience and capacity in the archive sector. Uh, we developed 12 programmes of work uh, of which the digital engagement toolkit is one of them. Um, and we're going to continue to build on the gains made over the last three years uh, with our new strategy um, focused on digital capacity and resilience, which we're going to be launching um, this summer. So if you could move on to the next slide. So Plugged In Powered Up focused on engagement, access, and preservation. Um, all of these are intertwined, um, but we had specific work streams uh, sort of against each um, area. So next slide. So the Digital Engagement Toolkit, part of the engagement work stream, um, focused on helping archives develop how they use their collections to tell stories online um, and engage audiences in different ways. So we commissioned a digital creative agency to uh, co-create the toolkit with us and we developed it um, into three main sections. So there's the platform finder, the platform guides and a creative inspiration guide. Uh, next slide, please. So the platform finder um, helps you find the right platform based on the audience you are hoping to reach. So at the outset of the toolkit, um, I was very, very certain that we needed to have something on audiences in the toolkit um, because engaging with archives is different, especially in the digital sort of realm, is going to be different based on uh, which audience you're hoping to reach. And there was a, sort of a lot of back and forth about sort of how we define audiences. Um, we went with the kind of the general sort of, you know, the, the terms that we always hear, I guess, in the news and the media. Um, so we defined audiences uh, via baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y and Gen Z. And we don't we didn't want to be too prescriptive with this. We didn't want to say, you know, you want to reach Gen X, so you need to do these things. But we found working with the digital creative agency that there are trends that you see within particular demographics of audiences. Um, so we felt it was quite important to address um, that if you are looking for a particular audience, you know, if you're looking um, for to attract baby boomers, um, you're not necessarily going to find as many baby boomers on TikTok as you would perhaps if you were to invest in digital engagement on your website, on a blog, for example. Um, so each demographic um, on the platform finder has a section which gives an overview of the audience and their digital trends, and it offers platform recommendations based on um, the media format that you're hoping to um, sort of develop. So next slide. So this is just a screen grab of the Gen Y um, sort of overview. So you'll see at the top of the page, it kind of just gives you an overview um, of the, um, so Gen Y are millennials um, and they're the first generation of digital natives. So digital natives are comfortable with technology um, and consider it to be an integral and necessary part of their lives. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom there under platform recommendations, you can choose from audio, images, text or video, uh, depending on what you're interested in. Uh, so next slide. 
And then you, this is just a screen grab of the audio page. Um, so it just gives you recommendations for the best format of audio digital engagement for that demographic. Uh, so if you're looking to reach millennials, then um, a good shout is to maybe develop a podcast um, and sort of reach them that way. And then at the bottom under the you should look at, it will then take you to the specific platform page um, to uh, explore more there. Uh, so next slide. So the other uh, section of the toolkit is the platform guides. So we included 10 for this uh, sort of for our starter for the toolkit. We will look to develop more um, in the future uh, sort of as, um, as things evolve um, and new sort of, for example, we don't have anything on AR and VR. Um, and so that's something that we could look to include in the future. Um, so we have included blogs, digital, digital events and live streaming, digital exhibitions, uh, Facebook, Google Earth and My Maps, Instagram podcasts, TikTok, Twitter and YouTube. So next slide. So within the platform guides, um, they are not designed to be um, a one stop shop. You won't find everything that you need about that platform within uh, the guide. What we've tried to do is uh, not reinvent the wheel. So where there's a really excellent guide um, for something that already exists, then we will link out to that. So you'll find a lot of links in uh, in the toolkit um, and we sectioned out the platform guide so we have an introduction to the platform we have brief information on audience um the or the the audience that you might find um with, uh, most associated with that platform uh, a storytelling guide uh, specifically how to um use that particular platform for storytelling and then some creative thinking and exercises to sort of get you um, prompted and, and to start thinking about creating a story. Um, some inspiration across the uh, cultural sector. So this was really important um, for me that this was included. We include examples from across the heritage sector because there's such excellent examples across uh, museums and libraries and galleries um, and archives that I didn't want to just uh, include um, examples from archives because I wanted this to be a space uh, for inspiration um, for, for people. Um, so we have some really great content from across the cultural sector. Um, and then there's some helpful stuff, so some pointers to free and low cost software that you can use with the platform, um, how to measure impact and um, notes on accessibility and further reading if you're interested um, in the platform. So next slide. And then the last sort of section of the toolkit is the creative inspiration guide. So again, this was a really key part of the toolkit that um, that we really wanted to include. Um, and this is all about um, sort of, I guess, finding your creative flair and starting to think about how you might write a story or create a story. Um, so we, and this is where working with the digital creative agency was fantastic uh, because, you know, I know archive but I don't necessarily know how to write a story so they really came um, with so much inspiration and so much insight into how we can tell good stories um, in the digital space so we cover things like developing your style and your tone which might be different you know based on your which organization you work for um, where do we begin with writing stories um, and how can we use uh, multiple platforms platforms with the same story but we might use those platforms um, in different ways um, and then just talking about sort of like going through the creative process um, and how we might begin to develop our story. Uh, next slide please. 
So um, you can use a toolkit in a variety of ways. You know, if uh, you really don't know where to start, then the Creative Inspiration Guide can be a good first uh, step to start thinking about digital engagement and creative thinking. Um, and then if you have a particular platform in mind, you can go straight to the guide for that. Uh, but if you're flexible and you don't really know, um, you're sort of a bit just want to explore uh, which audiences you might uh, be interested in, then you can use the platform finder, which would suggest a guide for you based on which audience you're hoping to, um, to target. Next slide, please. Can you just move? Is, can you move on to the next slide? Is that okay? Uh, I seem to be having a problem. Sorry, Caroline. That's all right. It won't move on, I'm afraid. That's okay. Um, if you tell me what's next, then I can just, <laughs> I can speak to that. It, well, I'll stop screen sharing, Caroline, that's okay. if that's okay. And then yeah, that's fine. yeah. So I think if I remember um, what I did want to talk about um, next was just, yeah, that was it. So there was just a couple more sections, which I can briefly go through. So it was more about talking about digital engagement and how it can work for you. Um, so with digital engagement, obviously we, want to do so much within our organizations because we know the fantastic collections that we all have um and so we want to if you could just go to the slide before that one then i think that that would That's it. So um, just thinking about resources, how much time do you have to dedicate to this um, and don't overstretch yourself. So think about being selective with platforms and with frequency um, of posting as well. So it's good to have a plan. Are you uh, doing your digital engagement for an anniversary for, or a project or is it ongoing uh, general engagement? And also be strategic. Investigate how to collect data analytics um, because stats can really help contribute to a business case for resource. Um, so it's really good to, in the toolkit, there is, um, there is information on how you can collect, you know, um, impressions from Twitter and such. But it might be good to have a conversation with you in your own IT department if um, you can't necessarily collect data analytics, but they might be able to on your behalf because I really think that they can help. Um, and in terms of collaborations, um, the Museum of London and the Black Country Living Museum on TikTok did, did a fantastic collaboration last year or the year before, maybe, where... Um, I guess off the back of the Black Country Living Museum's sort of TikTok fame, um, they did some really great collaborations with the Museum of London. So that was a fantastic example of sort of two organisations working together um, on some sort of like fun digital engagement. So that's um, that's definitely, I would recommend checking that out if uh, any of you have TikTok. Um, so next slide, please. So I just want to kind of finish off um, with just some considerations. So um, Elon Musk bought Twitter in October last year. Um, and what ensued was a very chaotic few months with impaired user experience um, and the integrity of the app being called into question. Um, there was the whole debacle of the Twitter Blue subscription that was rolled out and then quickly rolled back because there was a host of impersonators um, impersonating businesses and media personalities um, and people hurriedly made Mastodon accounts um, and were ready to jump ship. Um, but would your audience be there if you use Twitter for digital engagement? Um, just because your organization moves to Mastodon, is your audience gonna be there for you to still engage with? Um, and the wider consideration of um, 
does the platform become at odds with your organization's ethics and values? Um, do you even want to be there anymore? So these are all kind of, I think, important questions that we should all be asking ourselves um, sort of, I guess, after the after the um, the what kind of ensued last year. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and similarly, uh, last month, the UK government banned TikTok on government devices. Um, so will local government follow suit on that? Um, Organisations invest a lot of resources into social media platforms. Obviously, it's where our audiences are, um, but they can be fragile. Um, although, you know, the TikTok... Um, the TikTok ban does affect a very small percentage of users. It should make us think about where we're investing our time and energy. Um, and so next slide, I think I'm just about to wrap up. So um, these these resources I've just put in here, if the slides will be circulated after, uh, just to help you out with more digital uh, resources. So Culture24 is an excellent organisation, which you should all check out because they have fantastic resources. Um, Primarily, they say to help museum people, but I think that they uh, can help anyone in the heritage sector. Um, and also the Digital Heritage Hub is a free resource that can help small to medium sized organisations uh, with digital questions. And so that's it from me. Um, and I apologise for all the technical issues. <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Caroline, and well done for keeping calm and carrying on uh, through, throughout that and uh, you came over loud and clear so uh, that was the right decision to share the slides separately so yeah just huge thanks and thanks to everyone today I can see from the chat that people are really fascinated by what's been happening and turn my screen on so um we're, we're just having some about 20 minutes now for a, a panel discussion so if you have got questions do stick them in the chat but um I just wanted Susanna Barnes I noticed you'd put in the chat um, some stuff around the story trails that were that still was all kind of reverberating. Would you mind unmuting and just telling us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so, so we were part of story trails. When I was looking at the um, presentation, I could say, oh, that's bricks and that's bricks. And, um, so um, I think the VR headsets have been really critical that, that um, we've been able to use them with groups and different, we've used it with. Um, something called the Stockwell Good Neighbours, which is a, a group of very elderly, um, mainly Caribbean, mainly Caribbean women, but a few men. And we've used it for schools. There is a 13 age um, restriction on youth, but it's that sort of engagement and bringing the um, past, the, really actually telling the stories. And the, when David Arshoga came and gave a talk and he was talking about the democratization of the metaverse. And I think that's really important. It's a space we've just got to get in and grab. Um, and I, th I think the thing is, it's how we take it forward. Um, the partners for Story Trails have been amazing. We're currently also going through, we're getting a new archive building in the next few months. And we've got lots of digital questions. Um, I might, uh, someone from our IT department is here um, on this <laughs> web seminar because, um, we we want very much to increase this digital space for, for our service and actually any partnerships any other authorities can advise us about how to do this we, we're looking for help and support thanks Susanna yeah and, and any 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 thoughts about that please do stick them in the chat and we can we can make sure that Susanna gets them. Um, interesting, Susanna, you raised a thing about the, the sort of teenagers and age ranges. And, and Will, I know that somebody is asking there, who was it that asked? Oh, Jay Rowe is asking the question about um, did Meta put any stipulations on usage by children under 13, Will? Yeah, I've just posted a message in the chat. Oh, sorry, um, it, it's an unregulated space. So, so this isn't like TV or film, there is no regulator, there's no real uh, guideline other than manufacturers guidelines. And to be honest with you, they vary so much that I wouldn't really trust any of them. So I would say you must adopt the common sense approach to this and you must work in a way where you're responsible for working with audiences. We decided uh, very early on after the first leg of the tour in OMA that we couldn't 
stop families and children from under the age, under the age of 16 engaging we were going to put a, a line over it so we took the view that we were going to require parental consent and so we got parental consent in order to show experiences um and then if children under eight were in the library we would let them have the headset but we wouldn't put anything through it so so that was the idea of for them they could have a headset on and look into it but there was nothing for them to look at really but but i think that idea of um getting guidance is very important uh and i probably would say this but i would imagine all of the libraries here could have a local higher educational establishment that they could talk to that may maybe work in this space who would be willing to to support potentially um and hats off to Susanna in uh, in Brixton. That 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 was a particularly memorable uh, part of the leg for many reasons. Uh, it, it fell during the um, the Queen's uh, uh, demise, and uh, we came very close to not being able to put the show on. Uh, and if it wasn't for Susanna, that show would never have happened. Mm. So. <clears throat> And well done both of you. And, and we're while you're on the on unmuted, there's a question about um from B Brown about our story future still donating Oculus Quest devices to libraries. If so, is it possible to apply for them? Um I am not sure. I think our legacy team have very recently um I'm not saying close the door, but I think I think that program is now coming to an end. But I'll I'll pass on my contact details and please contact me if you would like to know more as I think I you know you can see I alluded to at the end there we're very keen that what we delivered continues but what we do can't continue without significant investment what you saw was a multi-million pound project there kindly funded via DCMS through an unboxed program we have some very big arms to twist if we think we can do this again. So we need to win this argument about the reinvention of libraries as a custodian and guardian for the next iteration of the internet at a level at which somebody would be willing to fund that. Mm. That's what we would like to do. Mm. Sounds great. And yeah, the, the results are there for everyone to see. I, I was really interested just to, if I can jump in really for Tracy and Will really about about impact and, and you both alluded to the impact and Tracy you particularly talked about the impact on the community but I was also interested in the impact on other organizations around you so um, Tracy particularly for you for the for the, the, the high street itself and for those partners how have they um, perceived your projects and, and are they making use of it too and uh, you know will, will they su continue to support the development of it do you think well, um, I mean, I, I said in my preservation in my presentation that our uh, project was very much an evolution, um, and it's it's still um, ongoing. I mean, the VR stuff, of course, the limitation is the headsets. Um, I don't know if anyone can see that, but I didn't say that we we use the Oculus Quest um, headsets as well, and we got funding through for, for those through the um, the National Archives testbed the archives testbed funding. So that's what paid for our headsets. So the actual headsets themselves are what limit the um, the the engagement, if you like. Um, we managed to get three three of them from the, um, the 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 funding, so we we do take those out and use them uh, at every um, uh, available opportunity. But what I would really say is that the project that we've done it's all about the building of the relationships. So we now have really strong relationships um, with um, Sodi Hall Bid. Um, you know, the council itself has has the relationships there, but it doesn't always trickle down to libraries. And what we've been doing, particularly with the Back to the Future event in the theatre and so on, that really did um, engage lots of um, uh, of key players locally. Um, and there was such a goodwill and such a buzz uh, uh, about the event that we did um, that that does, does still carry on. Um, so, we, you know, we are trying to work out, because I say what I really want to do is get some sort of learning 
platform um, going. Um, and I love, you know, the code club stuff that happens in libraries. And I want an adult version. I want to go to one myself, to be honest, because <laughs> what I didn't mention was that the software blender is free of charge, but it is quite difficult to learn. Um, I've tried to teach myself and failed four times. So um, so if anybody out there does do blender tuition, then please, please remember me um, <laughs> because I'm still trying to learn um, very much uh, myself. And, and I really like the idea of, um, of adults, particularly coming together for these learning opportunities that are more difficult to find when you're older than you know when you're still at school or at college um, and learning together really and so that's my my direction of travel but I do know through all the partnerships we've made through these sorts of projects that there are people I can reach out to and say hey we've got this idea come on you know come along and support us with it so it's just it's just trying really to get the right project at the right time um, so that we can exploit those links that um, that, that we've actually made yeah thank you Tracy okay. Will is there anything you wanted to add to that um I, I think we were fortunate in the the program hired two local creatives who were responsible for trying to forge the content in partnership with all of the companies we had under our belt and and with the communities in the library and I think the other thing to to kind of bear in mind when when you're looking for the sums of money that we're looking for to do these sorts of projects we, we try to work out how we can get people to the library who might not be frequent library users um so i would argue that in terms of community and benefit one of the things i hope we were able to do was bring people in who may not be heavy library users and i think that's the other aim is to try and find a way in which you can tell stories that bring people in who may not previously have had their stories told in this way and the idea of telling stories in in three dimensions is relatively new so i think one of the opportunities going forward is to understand that libraries generally have very strong relationships in terms of local stories and local heritage and then understanding that that can become the building blocks for the stories that you may the experiences you may want to engage you may want to create um and i think if if we can get the finance and the, and the will to to kind of go forward one of the things we'd like to do i think is delve deeper into the idea of community heritage and the 3d internet the mm. idea of as tracy's already identified right that, that there's something very powerful about being able to tell these stories at a hyper local level yeah. that's the thing that that makes this really work i think mm. Yeah, I think I think I, I really liked in your presentation the way you talked about that kind of a national project, but the sort of the hyper localness of it, which is is so powerful, and it really connected back to what Tracy was saying about her love and the love that people have for their communities through through this project. And Caroline, just in terms of audiences, you know, your toolkit. Somebody said in the in the chat, your toolkit toolkit looks really interesting and useful. And you you've talked a lot about that segmentation of audiences and making sure you're reaching audiences on platforms that they're using. Is there something as well about pushing audiences to new platforms, whatever, however, wherever they are in their in their lives and so on? And how does that happen? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I mean my my mum's on TikTok you know like it, I, just because you know an audience you know is a per, in a particular demographic doesn't mean that you know they shouldn't or can't have access you know to these um to these sort of um platforms it was it's more thinking about the trends of audiences mm -hmm. so you know, if you're limited in budget and time um, and there's a particular audience you want to go for you can have a quick win with that but it's um it's about you know um like Tracy's presentation you know on the VR headsets you know if you can have um you know launched during carers week like you know that's a really great thing to have the older generation experience in vr um it's sort of where and i guess if you can tie in anniversaries you know like um the um in 2020 um 
it was the the um sorry for the current not 2020 the coronation last year and um, there was a lot of sort of examples that I came across of um just putting content out there on digital platforms so it is about experimentation but I think it should be sort of um and it's great if you can get external funding because again I think it all does come down to resources you know people time money um it, I think external funding and small grants is great for having that investment to maybe experiment into different audiences mm -hmm. yeah thank you um I've got folklore library and archives I, and you've you've talked a lot throughout the the uh in the chat about your work and how it kind of connects back and you've also talked about using preservica for digital delivery do you want to just unmute and just tell us a little bit about your your thinking and your work yeah no problem oh thank um, you <laughs> i'm mark by the way the, um, <laughs> i won't keep calling you folklore <laughs> <Thank No>. you. <laughs> if i put it on the end it fell off um <laughs> yeah we're so so we're a non-profit um organization but we're based within a physical library, which is part of the public library structure. So um, we're in credit and library in Devon as a physical base. So within the library's unlimited um, building, um, but we're a separate nonprofit organization. My, my role crosses over because I founded the Folklore Library and Archive and so act as that as a curator, uh, but also work for Devon libraries with a different hat on as well. Um, we work in very close partnership with, with um, credit and library in fact with, with kind of local history and um, community resources and things like that. We've, so we've been running a reminiscence project for example for the last six months to capture um, oral histories um, not just related to folklore um, but related to the way that the community interacts here and, and we're looking at extending that with other things as well such as um, we have quite a lot of Ukrainian refugees coming in at the moment. Um, so we're looking at how their culture is integrating with the culture in Devon, which is very specific in, in many respects and how those things tie together. Um, and, and this is all um, then delivered digitally along with um, the next stage of the process will be will be transcription for, for accessibility, obviously. Um, we have quite extensive image archives and, and a lot of local history resources within credit in which we deliver on their behalf through our system on Preservica. Um, so so we, we use Preservica for, for that sort of thing because it's um, free to use to start with and, and then relatively inexpensive to use at a lower level of entry, uh, but is fully future, future proofed um, and, and is um, very easy to use um and very easy to access for for the public as well uh and we're very fortunate that, that, that there's a really strong interest in in history and heritage in this area um so we find that we can make a lot of ties within the community um to capture those kinds of resources and then to deliver them digitally well, thank you thanks for, thanks for sharing that mark <laughs> um uh, are there any other questions that anybody wants to just ask before we wrap up i think we're sorry i can't see everybody so do shout if i've missed any questions no, okay. I don't think there's any. Well, I, I really, I think I just wanted to to thank you or thanks all the speakers because it's been a really fascinating um, session. And what I've really loved is that you've talked about how much it's about um, emotionally connecting people to their, giving them a sense of place, connecting with their heritage, but also actually with their with their with their future as well. And that's what's really powerful about this. Um, giving them new skills, giving them new inspiration, I think. And I we I think somebody highlighted it when we all talked about library staff be, needing to be trusted guides to the metaverse. I think that's a, that's our, our call to action as we get we go away today. So um yeah I just wanted to just say a huge thank you to Caroline and to Will and to Tracy. Um, Chris, is there anything you or, or Sarah actually, is there anything you'd like to add before we, we wind up? Um, I suppose thinking about it, there's so much opportunity out there with this. Um, it's incredible the speed in which things have changed and I think probably the thing that you didn't touch on is that 
look at archives and some of those documents, there's software out there that can physically transcribe it electronically into a form which people can just literally read as it would be now. So there is so many platforms out there and Will's kind of call to uh, push the future, try to build that national picture is a really good example of kind of what I suppose I was talking about at the start really, and how can we continue this, this journey and, and build together successfully across the sector. Yeah, thank you. 